Hello everyone, I am Shruti Varashar and in this video we'll be talking about the self. So this is a self. Our earth is inhabited by different kinds of living organisms who look very different from each other. These living organisms can be eubacteria, protista, fungi, plants, animals, even human beings. The bodies of living organisms are made up of these microscopic units called cells. These are measured in microns and they cannot be seen with naked eyes because they are microscopic. So we view cells with the help of microscopes. The cell has the same central position in biology as an atom in the physical sciences. A cell is the basic functional and structural unit of life. It is a basic functional and structural unit of life. It makes up the living bodies. Likewise, in physics, we have atoms that make up matter in cell. The same way we have cells in biology, we have cells that make up living bodies. So a cell can perform a lot of functions on its own. For example, nutrition, respiration, growth, and reproduction. That is why it is known as the basic functional unit of life. And Many cells combine to form tissues, tissues combine to form organs, organs form organ systems, organ systems form organisms. So the basic idea is that cell is the foundation of life and it gives structure to living bodies. So it is the basic functional as well as structural unit of life, of living organisms. Present day cells share common fundamental properties. For instance, all cells employ DNA as their genetic material. They are surrounded by a plasma membrane and they use the same basic mechanisms for energy metabolism. On the other hand, present day cells have evolved a variety of different lifestyles. Many, consist of, many organisms consist of single cells. Such organisms are known as unicellular and many organisms consist of more than one cell. So those are known as multicellular organisms. So we have unicellular and multicellular organisms. Unicellular organisms are made of one cell. Multicellular organisms are made of more than one cell. All activities in unicellular organisms are performed by a single cell. So there is no division of labor. One cell is going to perform all activities. No division of labor. And in a multicellular organism, cells are specialized to perform different functions of the body so that there is a division of labor between cells. So specific cells that share common functions from tissues and likewise, Different cells perform different functions. That is why one cell does not have to perform all the functions of the body. The lifespan of a unicellular organism is short, is very short. Whereas in multicellular organisms, it is comparatively long, right? And when we talk about unicellular organisms, reproduction consumes that single cell. It is made up of one cell. And when the organism reproduces, the cell is consumed. So reproduction consumes the cell or in other words, organism because that organism is that cell. So why does this happen? How can we say that reproduction consumes a single cell? This is an amoeba. This is the structure of an amoeba. Amoeba is a unicellular organism. So this whole thing is one cell. This amoeba has one cell. The lifespan is short. 
and all activities all life activities are carried out by this single cell when this amoeba reproduces so the method of reproduction in amoeba is binary fission so in binary fission the nucleus and cytoplasm of amoeba divide into two parts and it forms two dot results so this amoeba this is parent amoeba and the nucleus is going to divide into two parts this will give rise to two daughter cells this is daughter cell one this is daughter cell two this is the parent cell right so likewise this parent is no longer alive it has sacrificed itself for the formation of these two daughter cells to be practical so all cells, whether they exist as one single celled organism or as a part of multicellular organisms, they are capable of carried out, carrying out certain basic functions such as nutrition, perspiration, growth, and reproduction. These functions are essential for the survival of the cell. The most important fun and fundamental level in the organization of living world is the cellular level. Cells are the fundamental structural and functional units of living organisms that are the basic unit of life. Cell biology is the study of the cells in all aspects of structure and function. Now we talk about unicellular cell example. We come here to multicellular organisms. So multicellular organisms contain more than one cell and in these types of organisms cells with specific specialized cells with common functions group to form tissues tissues group to form organs organs group to form organ systems and organ systems form organisms organisms so in here we have different types of organ systems so this is the respiratory system then we have the skeletal system we have the nervous system we have the digestive system we have the excretory system and here last one skeletal system this is the nervous system so we have different types of system, organ systems in our body for example if you look at this system which is the digestive system we see that this digestive system is made up of a number of organs pancreas stomach large intestine small intestine then we have the liver all these are organs these organs are made up of tissues tissues made up of cells these cells this level that is the cellular level is the most important and fundamental level of the organization or organization of the living world now we know what are cells we know what are unicellular organisms we know what are multicellular organisms now we talk about how was cell discovered so there was this man named robert hook who was studying a thin size of cork and Robert Hooke saw that the cork resembled the structure of a honeycomb consisting of many little compartments. And the honeycomb that is in this shape, a rough shape. So he found those cells in that cork to resemble this shape. And that honeycomb has many little compartments. So basically a cork is a substance which is obtained from the bark of a tree. This was the year 1665 when Hook made his, this chance discovery through a self-designed microscope. This was the self-designed microscope designed by Robert Hook. Under this microscope, he observed the cells of a cork. Cells of a cork. And he observed Cork's honeycombed and porous structure and he found that porous structure of the cork to resemble with monasteries and he called these units cells. 
So the discovery of cells happened in 1665. He published this book, this book called Micrographia, and he had this work of discovery of cells in that book in 1665. Next, there comes another man named Anton von Leeuwenhoek. In 1674, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch microscopist, made an improved microscope. Using this microscope, he discovered the free living cells in pond water for the first time. This is the Leeuwenhoek microscope, which was created by Anton von Leeuwenhoek, an improved microscope, improved version of Robert Hooke's microscope. And here, this Dutch scientist found free living cells in pond water, and he did this discovery in 1674. Discovered living cells in pond water. So this was the improved microscope. Then, he discovered the sperm and identified the sperm cells of humans, dogs, rabbits, frogs, fish, and insects. So what is a sperm cell? It is basically a male gamete that take part, takes part in the reproduction. We'll go on to that in another video on reproduction. Right now, let's focus on cell. However, Hooke had only seen the thickened walls of a cell and not the substance created contained within these walls. Robert Brown. A Scottish botanist, in 1831, he discovered and named the nucleus. This is a nucleus. These are nuclear pores. This is the nucleolus. And these are chromatin fibers. So this is the structure of a nucleus. And Robert Brown, in 1831, discovered and named the nucleus in plant cells. Then we talk about J.E. Perkins. He was a Czech animal physiologist, and in 1839, he gave the term protoplasm. 1839 and protoplasm. So what exactly do you mean by protoplasm? Protoplasm is a living substance of the cell. That means it includes the nucleus, the cytoplasm, everything inside the cell. It is known as protoplasm, even the cell membrane. So then when J.E. Perkin J. told us that there is this protoplasm, which is the living fluid substance present inside the cell, in 1866, Hegel, H-A-E-C-K-E-L, Hegel. So this man, in 1866, he established that the nucleus was responsible for storing and transmitting hereditary characters. What do you mean by hereditary characters? Hereditary characters. So if you look at your mother or father or sister or brother, you'll see that there is some common similarity in between you. So maybe your facial expressions or your body structure or your height or your, you know, way of speaking or say your face. So there might be some similarity between you and your brother, you and your sister, you and your mother, you and your father, even grandfather. So basically these characteristics that match or are similar to each other are because of these hereditary characters so here we talked about the structure of nucleus and i told you that these threads are chromatin these are chromosomes human cell have 23 pairs of chromosomes right and these chromosomes carry genes that carry the DNA that is basically responsible for this transfer of hereditary characteristics. 
Now, Haeckel in 1866 established that the nucleus was responsible for storing and transmitting these hereditary characteristics. Next, we talk about the cell theory. So now that cell is discovered, we know some basic features of a cell and life. So now we talk about the cell theory. Cell theory. In 1838, Jacob Matthias Sheldon, Sheldon, let me just write Sheldon here. He was a German botanist and he proposed the idea that all plants consist of cells. All plants consist of cells. Sheldon told us this in 1838. Next, one year later, Theodor Schwann he was a German zoologist, independently asserted that all animals and plants are made up of cells. So this happened in the year 1839. He said that plants and animals, both of them are made up of cells. This gave the foundation of the cell theory. The cell theory was refined Further in 1855, when another German biologist, R. Virchow, represented the idea that all cells arise from pre existing cells. So, his actual aphorism that he used was omnis cellulae a cellula. That means all cells come from pre existing cells by reproduction, like we saw in amoeba earlier. Thus, the cell theory comprises of some postulates. The first one says that all organisms are made up of cells and cell products. All organisms, I'm just giving you the gist here, are made up of cells and cell products. Cell products like secretions. Secondly, all metabolic reactions take place inside the cell. All metabolic reactions happen inside the cell and the cells are structure and function units of life so these are two points the third point says that all our cells arise from pre-existing cells all cells come from pre-existing cells they do not drop off somewhere from somewhere. They do not appear from thin air. They cannot originate spontaneously or come into, and they come into being only by the division of already existing cells. This happens by cell division. Next, the fourth point is that every organism starts the life as a single cell. Every organism starts their life as a single cell so whenever you look at a small baby that baby basically turns grows and then turns into an adult so it did not happen some for, for of some sort of magic the cells in that human being divide and the increase in number that is why we grow so if free organism starts the life as a single cell then by cell division meiosis mitosis it becomes two four eight sixteen and like that we grow now what this was the cell theory sheldon and schwann proposed this basic theory which was further improvised by arvard chow presenting the idea that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. We come up with all organisms are made up of cell and cell products. All metabolic reactions take place inside the cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells and every organism starts the life as a single cell. Next, we talk about two types of microscopes. 
Cells are too small to be seen with the naked eyes. Cells are studied with the help of microscopes. So a microscope is basically a high resolution instrument that is used for observing the fine details of very minute objects. Two common types of microscopes are light microscopes or compound microscopes. And the second one is the electron microscope electron microscope the simple student's microscope which is often used in school is the compound microscope or the light microscope one and the same thing in these microscopes many lenses are combined together and their magnification power range from 300 to 1500 times these microscopes use light, which is generally sunlight, to illuminate the object. So these compound microscopes are therefore known as light microscopes too. When and the object or specimen is kept in the glass light and it is kept on a stage under the objective piece having lenses almost in the middle of the microscope. Light is passed through the object or specimen with the help of the mirror called the reflector and a condenser from below magnifies the image of the specimen. The upper and large knob is meant for coarse adjustments and the lower and small knob is used for fine adjustments. For example, getting perfect image of the object. The magnification of an image can be increased or decreased by changing the objectives a high or low bar accordingly, like five times, 10 times, 15 times, etc. When we talk about the electron microscope, it uses electromagnets. So it is a really large instrument that uses electrons for illumination. This remarkable instrument was developed by Noll. K N O L L and Ruska R U S K A. These were two people of Germany in 1932, and it was developed in 1932. It was put to use in 1940. It uses very high voltage electricity. Electron microscope helps in observing subcellular structures which cannot be seen in naked eyes. So the basic difference between light microscope and electron microscope is that. Light microscope uses glass lenses, whereas electron microscope uses electromagnets. And light microscope uses a beam of light to illuminate the object, whereas the electron microscope uses electrons to illuminate the object. In a light microscope, the internal vacuum is not required. Internal vacuum is not required. It is required in electron microscopes. So in this video, we started about what is a cell, how a cell discovered, the cell theory, unicellular organisms, multicellular organisms, Robert Hooke and Anton von Leeuwenhoek's discoveries, light and compound microscopes in the next video we'll be covering the further topic of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and division of labor in cells i hope you like the video thank you and have a nice day do like share and subscribe